guys. Hi. Hi. I before I start telling my stories, I would love to know a little bit about you. Who has been to the Gentle Barn? Nice. And who loves animals? <laughs> Yay. And who is vegetarian? And who is vegan? Oh, right on. Okay, cool. All right. Just, um, so I have worked, I have lived in a barnyard for 20 years. <laughs> and I have seen things with animals. I've seen their intelligence. I've seen their affection. I've seen their relationships. I've seen them celebrate birth and mourn death. And I've just seen things that most people wouldn't even believe. And the 20 year time with horses, cows, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, turkeys, peacocks, llamas, dogs, cats, and a parrot, what that has all totaled 20 years with them is the very firm belief that I now have that we are all the same, we just look different. And that is what every single solitary one of them has proven to me time and time and time again. So I have a lot of stories, but I wanted to share some with you today. Um, the Gentle Barn was my dream since I was seven, but it started because I discovered an abusive petting zoo. And to make a long story short, I started bringing animals home from there. So early on in the first year of the Gentle Barn, I rescued a goat named Zena. And Zena was a very beautiful goat, and I rescued her with her tiny little nursing baby. And we brought her home from the petting zoo. She very quickly realized that she was in heaven and that she would be taken care of. And she very lovingly nursed her baby and um, groomed her and protected her. And I got to see that baby grow up in the barnyard. And I got to see Zena really mothering her. And it was an amazing experience. A few months after we had rescued them and brought them home, I came out very early one morning to feed and clean and take care of everybody. And on the ground was four newborn babies. Now, I didn't have a clue that anybody was pregnant. So I actually even thought that my neighbors were playing a joke on me. And I looked over all three fences to try to find the neighbors that were laughing at me, and there were no neighbors. And then I realized, oh my God, he's like one of my animals. So. I quickly discovered that it was Zena. So it never occurred to me that she was pregnant because I rescued her with a tiny nursing baby. So I didn't think that they would impregnate her that fast, but they did. Once I realized that those babies belonged to Zena, now the thing is, is that goats typically have one baby. It's very common that they have twins, but four babies is not common. And it's, they don't often do well. Four babies is a lot in the womb and things can often go wrong. So when I looked closer, I realized that two babies were stillborn and the other two babies were clinging to life with all they had. Things were not looking good. Now, because I didn't know she was pregnant, I hadn't planned for that and I was alone in the barnyard and it was just me by myself. Zena outweighed me by quite a bit. I mean, she weighed 250 pounds and I had to get her into a crate onto my truck and to the vet by myself. And I didn't exactly know how I was gonna do that, but I knew that I was gonna do that. So I started by trying to pick Zena up and put her in the crate. That did not work. Then I tried to lure her into the crate with food. She wasn't going for it. Then I tried to push her and pull her and it turned into a tug of war, which Zena was clearly winning. So a half an hour later, dripping with sweat, exhausted, muscle shaking, and I was, Afraid. I was really afraid. I mean, with every passing minute, the prognosis for those babies looked worse and worse. So finally, I sat down and out of pure desperation, I looked at Zena and I said, Zena, your babies are dying. I am trying to get them to the hospital so they can get help so your babies can live. Please, I am begging you to cooperate with me. And as soon as they're healed, I'll bring you back to the general barn. And as soon as I said that, she looked at me and she was like, why didn't you just ask? and she went in the crate and sat down. Now is the day that I realized that these animals understand everything. You know, they don't have the ability to talk English or our human language, but they understand everything. And that was the day that I implemented a rule at the Gentle Barn that has been steady ever since for the last 20 years, that before we do anything with an animal, whether we put a halter on them, whether we're brushing them, whether a vet's coming to do something with them, or we're taking them somewhere, we always explain what we're doing and why. 
because I believe they understand everything. So Zena taught me so much. Another animal that I rescued from that original petting zoo, her name is Katie. And Katie was probably the most angry animal I've ever met. She was this little teeny miniature horse, and if you even looked at her, she wanted to bite your face off. She was angry all the time. Um, and she had a lot of reasons why to be angry. She was never heard, she was never respected, she was never loved. So I brought her home to the gentle barn, and my job became to earn her trust. And I had to work hard, <laughs> but I did eventually. Um, so in those days, and actually still today, I would go out at seven o'clock on the dot to feed all the animals. And they knew that. But one particular morning, Katie started neighing at six. And I'm like, and I kept hollering out the window, like, I'll be right there. I, and at first I was like, well, I got another hour. And then I was like, I'll be right there, I'm coming, I'm coming. I had to feed everybody in the house first. So finally, I went out at seven, like I always did. And then I realized why she was crying. She wasn't crying for breakfast at all. She was crying because one of our little goats had wandered into the pig's pool and got stuck in the middle. So I was like, oh my God, Katie, I'm so sorry. That must have been so frustrating for you to call me and I wasn't coming, I'm so sorry. And I got the goat out of the mud hole and um, apologized a thousand more times to Katie. And that's when we implemented the idea to always sleep with our windows open and to always take their cries seriously. Because yeah, sometimes they're crying for breakfast, but other times they might have a more important, more urgent reason to call for me. And so now we always sleep with our windows open and every time they cry, we're out there trying to figure out what they need. And sometimes it is a false alarm. There have been many, many nights where I heard screaming like you wouldn't believe it from the populated pigs. And I thought, there is a mountain lion eating one of my pigs. And I'd go running out there, barely dressed, barefoot. And I'd see the pigs going, he touched me. No, you touched me first. And they're just having a pig argument. And I'd be like, go back to sleep. So there have been a lot of false alarms, but there are ha have been a lot of real situations where they needed us and we heard them because Katie taught me how to listen. So also from that original petting zoo, there was Grandpa Goat. And Grandpa Goat was, he was the Morgan Freeman of the goat world. He was so handsome. And he, you know that thing that Morgan Freeman has where he's just so handsome and so wise and you just want to listen to everything he says? Grandpa Goat had that. So Grandpa Goat was a white goat with a very full long beard. Full white beard. So wise. Big golden eyes that would stare into yours for as long as you needed him. And he had amazing big curly horns that he walked around the barnyard. So powerful, so strong. But his toenails were never cut at that petting zoo. And so when he came to the gentle barn, it took us a long time to trim down his toenails and massage his deformed legs so he was able to walk again. Now, a lot of times when we bring animals in with mobility challenges or deformities or whatever, or illnesses, a lot of the times we'll correct those illnesses or deformities, and then they do really, really well for many, many years. But then at some point when they get really, really old, those old injuries or ailments or arthritis can start creeping back in. So we worked really hard to get Grandpa Goat walking and thriving, and he did. He became the king of our barnyard, and he was something to behold, really. But once he started becoming very, very old, those struggles with his leg and the arthritis and the pain started creeping back in until he reached a point where he couldn't really walk anymore and he was kind of walking around on his knees. Now shortly after we rescued Grandpa Goat, we rescued Emily. And Emily was a tiny little, young, petite, beautiful, pretty little thing. And she took one look at Grandpa and was like, oh my. And she vowed to love him for the rest of her life. So she would sit near him and she would eat with him and she would sleep with him and she would fawn over him and fuss over him and groom him. And she was like his little minion. She loved him. So when he got older and older and older and it started becoming harder and harder for her, him to walk, we knew the time was coming close that we couldn't just let him be there. Well, one, so what we did was we made a huge big nest out of really thick, fluffy straw. So he had a nice soft bed to sleep on and he was in the middle of a very big bed so he would be safe and secure through the night. But one night, 
Emily started screaming. And because of Katie, we had the windows open, so the minute she started screaming and waking me up, I ran out to see what she needed, and sure enough, Grandpa Goat had fallen out of his bed somehow and couldn't get back on there. So she called for help, I listened, we got Grandpa Goat back onto his bed and safe and secure, and then he slept peacefully through the rest of the night. She loved him. So when the day finally came, where you could clearly see he was suffering, he was in pain all the time. He couldn't rest, he couldn't get comfortable, he was barely eating, and I looked at Grandpa Goat one day and I said, Grandpa Goat, it's time to go choose another body. I can't let you stay in this body anymore. And he looked at me and he said, I don't wanna go. Emily will be lost without me. And I said, I totally hear you and I promise I'll take care of her, but I cannot have you stay in that body anymore. And he didn't want to go, but I made him. And it's one of those things that will probably haunt me for the rest of my life, because on one hand, I know that I did right by him. And on the other hand, having an animal say they don't want to go and making them go is like a terrible decision that nobody should have to make. But I couldn't have him suffer. Not for me, not for Emily, not for anyone. Anyway, Emily was absolutely beside herself. And she stayed in his bed where he left for another week. She wouldn't get up, she wouldn't eat, she wouldn't play with the others. And I even had several vets come out to like, is there something wrong with her? What should I do? Should I force feed her? What should I do? And they were like, yeah, make sure she has food and water, but there's nothing wrong with her. There's nothing you can do. She died a week later. And I brought her to the state lab. I'm like, what happened? What did I miss? What was wrong with her? And they did a necropsy and there was nothing wrong with her. They said she was the picture of health, that she was unwilling to live in a world without her true love. They love as deeply as we do. So there was Tommy. Tommy was our very first turkey. Tommy was a big boy turkey. He was absolutely the most handsome thing ever. And Tommy was being raised by a family that wanted to eat him on Thanksgiving, but when it came time to do the deed, they couldn't. So they knocked on my door Thanksgiving morning and said, will you take him? <laughs> we can't do it. So I brought Tommy in. Now I had, this is very early on at the gentle barn and I had never had a turkey before. So they said, there's something, there's two things that you need to know about Tommy. I said, yeah, tell me, because I've never had a turkey before, so I'm not the expert. They said, two things you need to know. First of all, he's dumb as a bag of rocks. So don't expect him to be smart or to know anything. Now that sounded a little untrue from what I know about animals, but I'm like, hey, what do I know? I mean, I've never had a turkey before. Okay, fine, what else do I need to know? And they said, you need to know that he's really, really dangerous. He's really aggressive. So you need to take a rake with you at all times when you're in the barnyard. Now again, I don't know, did my heart really resonate with that? No, but you know, I never had a turkey before and these people are more of an expert than I am, so okay. So for two weeks, I carried a rake with me. Everywhere in the barnyard. And it was kind of a pain in the butt because you know, raking, it just was hard. But I did it. And Tommy would look at me like, what's with her and the rake? He never gestured to me, he never chased me, he never ran after me. Even when I was close to him, he never postured. And finally, two weeks later, I put down the rake. And for, I've had Tommy for four years, and he was always a gentleman. He was loving and sweet and kind. Um, I eventually turned him into an ambassador and took him to schools where he would pose for pictures and let kids line up to pet him. And he was always gentle. So the very first night that I had him, I wanted to show him which room he would sleep and eat in. So it was just getting dark and I ushered him into the room and I was like, this is your room, this is where you're eating and sleep. He's like, I got it. Well, the next night it was just getting dark and I remembered turkeys are dumb. That's what I was told. So I was looking all over the barnyard for him to show him again where he would eat and sleep because he's not gonna remember because he's dumb, right? So I'm looking all over for him, I cannot find him. I'm looking behind the barn, I'm looking in the front of the barn, on the sides. Once again, I looked over the fence to my neighbors to see if maybe he had flown over there. There was no sign of him. And then I turned around and he was in front of the door waiting for me to open it. 
And that's when I realized these stereotypes that we have in our society are not true. I don't know like what sets them up and I'm sure that there's not smart turkeys out there, but there's also not smart people or not smart any of us. There's smart beings and there's not smart beings and there's loving kind beings and then there's aggressive angry beings. We all come in different shapes, sizes, personalities and flavors. And Tommy though was not dumb. He was very, very smart. And I never had to show him his bedroom ever again. I never had to show him anything. He knew everything. Um, and he was amazing. And I had a bedtime ritual with Tommy where I would stroke his feathers and I would sing to him and I would pet and kiss his little face and his eyes would close and that's how I put him to bed every night. And he loved me and I loved him and he became one of the loves of my life. Several months later, my husband Jay, we run the gentle barn together, Jay brought, bought me a female turkey for my birthday. And I, that was the day that I fell in love with Jay going like, okay, he knows how to impress a girl. <laughs> if you want to impress me, rescue me an animal. So that's what Jay did. He rescued me for my birthday, a female turkey. And she was lovely. Her name was Chloe. And Chloe and I had a really fun morning ritual. Every single morning, I would go out there at seven o'clock in the morning and I would feed all the animals. I would feed the horses, the cows, the, the goats and sheep, the hay. I would feed the pigs their porridge. I would clean up the yard and top off the waters. I would groom the horses. And this whole time, Chloe would follow me. And she was very, so boy turkeys like to show off. Chloe liked to talk. So she would follow me around the barnyard and she would tell me stories of her life and I would tell her how my morning was going and we would just swap stories and it was so fun. But on this one particular morning, Chloe followed me for a little bit longer than she normally had. And I started wondering like, is she trying to tell me something? Does she need something? The conversation just went on a little bit longer. And so finally I put down my rake and I sat down on the ground and I looked her in the eyes and I said, what is it Chloe, do you need something? And she crawled into my lap and fell asleep. And we've been cuddling girl turkeys ever since. That's when I learned that girl turkeys are just as affectionate as cats or dogs. That they love to climb in our laps and fall asleep in our laps. And they're amazing. So for those of you that haven't been to the Gentle Barn, I implore you to come to the Gentle Barn and cuddle a turkey. My favorite saying is, we have not lived life till we've hugged a cow or cuddled a turkey. It's the best thing ever. And we have wonderful cuddle turkeys now that are waiting for you. So just around that first time in the first year that I opened the Gentle Barn, we got in a chicken named Strawberry. Strawberry actually was rescued from a homeless woman. She had lost her house and she was living in her car with like 30 animals. And I discovered her on the side of the road one day and I was like, can I help you? And so I brought all of her animals home to the Gentle Barn except for her two dogs that stayed to be her witnesses. And Strawberry was one of them. And Strawberry was a little, little chicken. She was a light golden, strawberry color. She was beautiful and she had really intense red eyes. And Strawberry, for whatever reason, loved to be held. So she would follow me around the barnyard and she would plant herself in front of me until I picked her up. And so sometimes I would have to clean the barnyard one-handed while I held Strawberry with the other hand. And ultimately, I ended up going in the house and fishing out an old baby uh, pouch from my, my son and I would wear it in the barnyard and on those days that she wanted me to hold her for three hours I'd put her in the little pouch and away we would go and I would do my chores and Strawberry would stay with me. She was lovely and then there were days where she would be five feet from me and she would get so excited about being held that instead of walking to me she would just hurl herself at me. She would just launch herself in the air and hurl herself and I would have to drop everything and catch her. And uh, she did that till the day she passed away of old age. She just always wanted snuggle time with mommy. Their affection is incredible. Their intelligence is amazing. And when we can see them with eyes that don't see the differences, but with hearts that see the similarities, they're like a magical rainbow. And they're amazing. So Strawberry had a little buddy named Charlie. And Charlie, was the little man of the house. And he was a little rooster. He was red with a beautiful cascading green tail. And he would just kind of walk around the barnyard like he owned everything, and he did. 
All the ladies loved him. He was amazing. And Charlie had this thing where he would, he would say goodnight to all his ladies as they kind of perched up into the eaves of the barn. And then once all the ladies were up there, he would lay down. And I don't know if he was laying down to keep watch. I don't know if he was laying down because he didn't think that physically he could get up there. But he would lay down on the ground. And I don't know if you guys know this about chickens, but they go blind in the dark. Once it's dark, they can't see. So laying there on the ground and being blind is not safe. If a raccoon comes, they could take him. It wasn't safe. So we had a ritual where the minute all his ladies went to bed and he laid down on the floor, I would pick him up and I would bring him into a coop for the night so to make sure he was safe. And that was our ritual. We did it every single night. I would just go find him wherever he was and put him in bed. And one night I was with friends and he was all the way across the barnyard. And I was all the way on the other side. And I was actually doing it to make my friends laugh. I kind of was just joking. And I said, Charlie, time for bed. And he perked up his little head and he came running at full speed all the way from one end of the barnyard to the other, to me. And I was like, oh my God. Here is this little chicken, and because we're raised in a society that says chickens aren't smart, they don't understand, they don't know their names, I had never, he had been waiting for me to call him all this time, and I never did. He had known his name this whole time, and I never used it. And when I realized, oh my God, he's just as smart as any dog. And I picked him up and put him in the coop, and then from then on for the rest of his life, all I had to do was call him, and wherever he was, he'd come running for bedtime. Wait till they're done. <laughs> so then this, can you guys hear me okay over the thing? So this is one of the most amazing stories. Then there was Susie Q. So Susie Q was a brown farm pig with floppy ears and she smelled like pancakes. And she was lovely. But Susie Q escaped from a slaughterhouse. So she, has, she was in line to be slaughtered. She was like, oh heck no. She crashed through a fence and ran down the street. The animal control picked her up, brought her to the shelter, and the reason they called us about her is because she was driving them bananas. Because she was so smart that she could open her own dog run and then let out all the other dogs. So when they came in the morning, it was about 50 to 100 dogs and a pig running around the shelter. And they could find no way to contain her, no matter what they tried. So they finally called me and said, you got to get this pig. So I said, bring her. So they bring, brought her to the gentle barn. Now, you can imagine what that must have been like to be in line to be slaughtered, to see the slaughter in front of you, to hear the screaming, to get out and know that all the family members that you left behind are not gonna make it. That is massive survivor's guilt. And that's what she had. She had survivor's guilt. So she came to the gentle barn. She lay down in the middle of the yard and she did not move. She wouldn't eat, she wouldn't drink, and she wouldn't get up. Now that first day, all the other animals were kind of like laying in the barnyard and playing in the barnyard too. So she wasn't alone. But then when night fell and it got cold and dark, all the other animals kind of one by one got up and went to the barn, leaving Suzy Q alone. Well, our cow at the time, she was our very first cow named Buddha. Buddha was the last animal to go into the barn and she was just about to sit down in the fluffy straw bed where she always slept every single night. And just as she was about to lay down, she looked back across the barnyard and saw Susie Q laying by herself. And instead of laying down, she crossed the barnyard and laid down next to Susie Q. And she stayed there for six days. Susie Q still wouldn't eat, but by the time a week had passed, now Susie Q had a friend, now she didn't feel so alone. She had the wisdom and the healing and the love from Buddha. And they got up together a week later and Buddha showed her around the barnyard, introduced her to all their friends, showed her where they slept, where the food was. We made a, a swimming pool for Suzy Q. And Suzy Q and Buddha were best friends for the rest of their lives. Best, best, best friends. 
So shortly after rescuing Suzy Q, we took in a little piggy named Truffles. And Truffles was a little eight-week-old black little piggy with an ever-wagging tail that never stopped wagging and four little white socks. And she would prance around the barnyard. And the minute Suzy Q saw that little piglet, she called dibs. And she looked at that little piglet and said, you're mine. We, we now belong to each other. So they ate together and they slept together and Suzy Q took that little piglet and put her on her tummy and she slept on her tummy for warmth for the rest of, of Suzy Q's life. So it was this beautiful family, a cow, a farm pig, and a little pot pig, all sleeping together, best friends forever. Well, one day, one day, it was a very calm, lazy afternoon. The chickens were scratching in the dirt and buck bucking to each other. The goats were chewing their cud and meditating under shade trees. And all the pigs were sleeping. But we had another pig at the time named Duncan. And Duncan was a 1,200 pound pig. He outweighed Suzy Q by 400 pounds. He was a massive, massive guy. And he was a little naughty, a lot naughty. So he woke up from that nap and decided that he was bored. Everyone else was sleeping. So he walked over to Truffles and he started nudging her just to find something to do, just be bored. And Truffle started squealing like, hey, buzz off, I'm sleeping. When the sound asleep Suzy Q heard her baby Truffle screaming, she woke up from a dead sleep, stood up, ran over to Duncan, body slammed him, shoved him into a corner and screamed in his face for 20 minutes. And Duncan, after eating the the lecture of his life. For the rest of Duncan's life, he didn't even so much as look at Truffles. He would walk by and he'd go, I'm not looking at her, I'm not looking at her. He never went anywhere near her. Their capacity to love, their capacity to nurture and mother. They adopt babies when there's an orphan in trouble. They love their mates and, and want to be with them forever. They love each other. They have best friendships. They, they mother babies. They have the same bond to each other that we do. They have the same love of life as we do. They love their babies just like we do. They mourn death just like we do. They celebrate life just like we do. They have the same intelligence. They have the same ability to perceive and to experience. And they just want a good life just like we do. So when I asked you earlier who loves animals, pretty much you all raised your hands. And I'm here today to ask you to help me help them. Because this Holocaust that's happening to animals will not be ended by a world war. This slavery that's happening will not be stopped by a civil war. This cruelty and suffering will not be, these animals will not be protected by law and by politics. If they're gonna have a gentle world, if they're gonna be set free from those cages, if they're gonna have, if they're gonna be able to raise their babies like we do, if they're gonna be able to fall in love and stay with each other like we do, if they're gonna be able to enjoy this planet like we do, then we're gonna have to stand up for them because they can't lobby for themselves. They can't riot or march for themselves. They can't vote for themselves. They need us to do it. So if we're the animal lovers, we need to be their voice. We need to stand up for them. We need to fight for them. We need to make this world better for them. And the thing is, is that we don't need to be superheroes. We don't need to learn to fly or learn to beat people up or go marching on the streets. We don't need to email our politicians, even though if you're doing that, that's good. The only thing we need to do, the one and only thing we need to do is to go vegan. When we go vegan, we save 200 animals every single year. That's thousands of animals over the course of just one lifetime. When we go vegan, we save 1,100 gallons of water a day. That will end this drought. When we go vegan, we save an acre of trees every single year, which will save our beautiful forests, but will also save ourselves. And when we go vegan, we reduce our own risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol level, and dementia by 90%.
That is our superpower. That is the most effective, most efficient, most powerful thing that we can do as individuals for animals, for this planet, and for ourselves. We will save everyone and we will save everything. So I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm begging you to help me vote with your dollars. When you buy food, when you go places, when you buy products, you're voting with your dollars. And you're either voting for peace, or you're voting for suffering. You're either voting for products that will be reverent for this Mother Earth, or you're voting to destroy it. You're either voting to destroy our bodies and for Western illnesses, or you're voting for health and vitality. And all the suffering and all the cruelty and all the agony, emotionally and physically, that animals go through every single day in this world, you're either hiring someone and paying someone to do it for you, or you're paying to instill peace on this planet for all of us. And a vegan diet is so easy. It's so easy. We get all the nutrients and all the protein and all the sustenance. Jay and I have raised our three kids vegan. I went through two pregnancies vegan. It's our superpower. It's how we save this planet. It's how we save all of us. Will you join me? Please join me. We need you. I need my army. I need backup. Please help us. And then come to the gentle barn and cuddle a turkey and hug a cow and look them in the eyes and rub a pig's belly and see for yourself how we're all the same. We just look different. Thank you.